Parents, what spooky past life memory did your kid utter? Story one. Oh boy, so much. What you have to consider is that my city, despite being moderately sized, is somehow also stuck in the 90s in terms of how people view pop culture. Nobody seems to believe there are other people on the internet. The only reason we somehow have some vestige of comic book culture is because, and I personally know this for a fact, the councilman for culture is friends with the owner of one of the two only comic book stores in town. And back in high school, there was one hilarious incident when I was mocked and literally told I was a flipping nerd because I made a joke about Game of Thrones, the show, which was by then on its second season. Story 2. Being Asian and skateboarding? I remember growing up wishing I was white in my predominantly white town. I used to get made fun of for my eyelids, how I looked, the foods I'd bring to school, and everything along those lines. It seems like as correct representation has happened, it's minimized, but I'm sure there's still a lot of swept under the rug and bullying still going on. I notice that people like to pick and choose what they like from Asian culture. They'll love anime, but hate Asian people for whatever reason. They'll want Japanese letters because it looks cool, but make Asian jokes regarding how they talk in broken English, or the same people who made fun of my eyes are the ones doing fox eye makeup to accentuate their eyes to be more slanted shaped. As for skateboarding, I used to skate a lot growing up because that was my way of transportation. I used to get called poor. I used to get bullied for wearing baggy clothes and having longish hair. I used to get picked on for not wearing tight Hollister stuff. Now at 20, I see everyone trying to dress the whole skater part thing. I see a lot of people swoon over skater dudes when even three years ago, they really would have been seen as a social outcast. I'm glad people are getting into skating. I just wish I didn't get bullied for the cow I enjoyed doing and the cow out of my control. Story 3. In 2006, my best friend Nick was KIA in Iraq. We used to wrestle fight until one of us submitted. These sessions would start randomly and always be initiated by showing your fangs. This involved pointing your pointer and middle finger down in front of your mouth while growling at the other person. A couple of weeks after his death, some family from the other side of the country that we only see every five years or so was visiting. My cousin's son, who was about five, and who I never met prior to this visit, comes over. He gives me the fangs and smiles. I asked him, where did you learn that? He says, your friend says hi and runs away. I went to my room and cried for a bit. Story 4. I was the child in this case. I don't remember any of this. But when I was four, we traveled to Ireland to visit my dad's grandparents. We were walking through a shopping area when I started yelling about wanting to see the train and ran into a shop. My parents ran in after me as I was going nuts about some train. There was no train, it was a clothing store. The woman working there asked my parents what I was doing as I was just running around frantically. I finally yelled, the train! I had found in the back of the store a framed newspaper clipping from the 1940s of the front window of this shop when it was a toy store and there was a big model train scene set up. Story 5. Not a parent, but apparently I look like the male version of my mom's grandmother. But creepier is apparently I act just like her and talk like her and think just like her. She passed away 10 years before I was born, I think. Maybe even before that and lived far, far away. The creepy part is none of this feedback comes from family members. It comes from random old people who knew her. The creepiest example is, as a teenager, we went to Disney in Florida and was chatting with an older couple with their grandkids. After a bit, the woman said I look and act just like her neighbor when she was growing up. Immediately, for no reason whatsoever, I blurted out, Soy yo Marisol. At that point, the woman never said her name was Marisol. I had no idea she spoke Spanish. Nor did she know I spoke Spanish. She responded, Deadpan Dora, last name? Decali underscore 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 in Buenos Aires? I snapped back to myself and stammered, I was her great-grandson. Meanwhile, my mom had shivers down her spine and started to tear up. I've also had several people with dementia who knew her call me by her name and try to play the remember when game. And some of those things they would bring up give me strong senses of deja vu. At my grandfather's funeral, this happened dozens of times from people I've never met. One day, I plan to go back to her hometown to visit if that's ever possible. She grew up outside of what was then Grudno, Poland, now Hrodna, Belarus, before moving to Buenos Aires during the Holocaust. I know traveling to Belarus isn't very common and sometimes not easy, but I wonder if I'll have some weird past life vibes being there. Story 6. Not a mum, but I was a nanny for many years. This is going to be long and I apologize in advance. One of my little ones, two hours old, incredibly smart child, way ahead developmentally in almost every way. He used to like to tell me things while we got him ready for bed. It was almost always these weird storied, which would always start with when I was an old lady, and they were always very specific little day-in-the-life-of type, things which I quickly realized went beyond the life experience, typical vocabulary of a two-wire-old. 
Over a few months, he kept adding very consistently to this story. He would also sometimes play as this old lady, with a cloth over his head and walking slowly as if his back pained him. Grocery shopping or playing with his sister's dolls as if they were his grandchildren was his favorite when he did this. He added some specific details like how many children she had, four daughters and a son, and how many grandchildren. Her husband had passed away in his 50s, same age as one of his uncles, from a lung disease. One of her daughters had passed away in their 30s in a car accident, leaving two children who she took in with the help of another daughter. She had a bad back and pain in her feet. One of her daughters would rub her feet to help with the pain. All but one of her children was married. The unmarried daughter lived with her, and she worried she would never marry. She remembered dying. She had been crossing a street and hit by a car. She described how people stood around her, where it hurt, how someone eventually lifted her into a car, no ambulances, and took her to hospital where she passed away. I was not his only nanny, and he was consistent with these stories. Us nannies would get together and swap stories, and I would write them down because I had been fascinated with phenomena like past lives before this and wanted to see where it all went. He also described the house neighborhood they lived in. This is especially interesting as this kid came from a super wealthy family and had never even seen the kind of housing or poverty he was describing. He also talked about living by the seaside. Months into this unfolding, we visited a seaside city on the other side of the country. One day, a family member there was having a birthday party, so we piled in the van to drive over, and our driver got lost. This is pre-Google Maps smartphone times. We ended up driving through this extremely poor neighborhood, and suddenly my little boy started shouting and screaming and insisted we turn down a couple of specific streets. He started pointing out the window and telling us things he was recognizing from when I was an old lady. It matched to what he'd previously described in general, and we were all so interested we let him direct us where to go, as we were already going to be late for the party anyway. He accurately described what we would see around the next turn several times, but got extremely confused and upset when he got to where her house was because it was now a store. The driver leaned out the window and asked a nearby old person what had been there before the store, and was told, houses. We never went back there or were able to get any additional verification. Totally understandably, his parents were concerned about this storytelling and how vivid and strange it was. So after this dramatic incident, we made an active effort to redirect him to other stories and play types. As he approached three, he started telling less less of these stories, and they got less less specific. By about three and a half, he couldn't even remember telling us stories about being an old lady. He thought we were joking with him. To this day, over 25 hours later, I can't explain it really. Edit. Thank you kindly for the Updutes Awards. I'm so moved, really. I didn't think anyone would read this because I was late to this topic, and I typed too much lol. I remembered some additional stuff replying to someone in the comments, so I thought I'd copy it here and add a little more. I wish I still had the notebook I was writing things down in so I could give more specific details. It's a long time ago, so I only remember the bigger highlights of it. I should mention that this did not happen in a Western country, and he was a super protected and privileged kid. He didn't even meet a child outside of his direct family till he was three when he started a very exclusive kindergarten after I spent several months begging his parents. He rarely watched TV, and when he did, it was highly curated. Pretty much just Barney, not even Disney movies. So there wasn't really a lot of exposure to background media he could have picked this stuff up from. And us nannies didn't talk about most of the stuff he would come out with, and none of us were originally from that country either. So the super specific cultural details he would come out with would baffle us. One of them was when he would play, he'd put a cloth over his head and dance in an extremely specific way. His auntie was visiting one day and saw him do it and fell about laughing. She said he was dancing like an old woman at a wedding. Like, specifically, a cultural dance traditionally done by mothers' grandmothers at weddings. There were more specific, odd little validations that happened as well. Also, we were specifically instructed not to encourage this play. In that culture, any non-conforming behavior is not well received. So there was fear. This was indication of him being other than normal. I say that in quotes because personally, I believe there is no fixed normal. Everyone is valid just the way they are. So we were not leading him on and playing into the scenario he was telling us about. We would actually try and redirect him away from it. Story 7. Obligatory, not the parent, but the kid here. Apparently used to have rather frequent bouts of nightmares back when I was four. And it always began with me screaming the name Sarah, then calling for help loudly which would wake pretty much everyone in the house up, and ending with me just blubbering out, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, over and over and over again, all the while crying and sobbing. When I would wake up in the morning, I'd have no recollection about any of this. My parents had no idea what caused it, given that they knew no one named Sarah that I had interacted with. We had no TV or anything of the sort. I hadn't begun going to preschool yet, 
and didn't know how to read beyond a few simple words. Nothing they did seemed able to stop it either. The whole thing went on for a good long while, almost a year, until one day, it just sort of stopped. Mom apparently tried asking me once about it, and Kidney said something to the effect of, Sarah doesn't want to see me crying anymore, so I won't. Didn't actually know any of this happened until some years back when I got to talking to my parents about how I always found the name Sarah to be beautiful. Story 8. Not me, but a friend's little sister. The whole family was out for dinner at a restaurant in a skiing village, which they recently bought a cottage near. My friend's little sister, as soon as they walked in, said, I know this place. My mother and I used to paint here, to which her mother replied, We've never been here before. What do you mean? She replied with, No, my mother from before. We used to paint here all the time. The family was obviously a little freaked out, but didn't think much of it as she was pretty young, and they figured just messing around. Later on, though, when talking to the waitress, the little girl again adamantly mentioned how she used to paint there, and the waitress revealed that it in fact was an art studio for many years in the 1900s, but had been converted sometime in the early 2000s into a restaurant. Needless to say, the entire table, waitress included, got goosebumps and were at a loss for words. Story 9. When he was three, my husband decided to treat our son to a flight over our city in a Cessna. When it was time to get on the plane, our boy climbed into the pilot's seat and was extremely upset when he was told he had to move. He began crying and saying he was sorry. He didn't mean to crash that plane last time and he said he'd be good this time. My husband managed to calm him by pointing out that his legs were too short for his feet to reach the pedals. Once he got settled in the back seat, he started fussing about not being able to use the radio, so the pilot got him a headset, just didn't plug it in all the way. Our son then started trying to raise the tower so he could to his radio check and get clearance. At that point, the pilot needed to take a break. He went for a breathe while my husband talked to our son, who told him that he crashed the last plane he flew and a lot of people passed away. When the pilot got back, they were able to do the flight with no further issues. About a year later, we went to an aeronautics museum when an old mosquito was being restored. Our son told the curator that he used to fly one of those, so he offered us a tour of the plane. When we got in, our son pointed out several things that were wrong with the plane, which turned out to be correct. Things like the joystick being the wrong sort, etc. The curator told us the plane had previously been modernized and was now being restored to original condition. He also confirmed that the items our son had pointed out were in fact slated to be replaced. Our kid has grown Mo and doesn't remember ever being a pilot before, and has absolute zero interest in planes, but he does remember just knowing things about airplanes and piloting them. Story 10? My daughter talks about her grandson all the time. I thought it was just an imaginary friend, but then a couple nights ago she came out of her room at bedtime absolutely sobbing and said, I'm sad because I miss my grandson. He lives in my old house in my old neighborhood. She has never lived anywhere other than this apartment edit. Totally thought this would get buried. To answer some questions, we have asked her about him but it's pretty hit or miss on whether she'll actually answer or just think it's a fun game. The other night after some questions, she told us that he sleeps in a crib and has a white tongue. But when I asked her his name a few hours ago, she said, Guga, and laughed and laughed. It totally could be just her imagination, but she also told me some weird things about the baby I lost a few months ago, which really makes me wonder if she remembers, knows things we don't. Story 11. When my daughter was three, she saw a large ship while we were on vacation at the beach and said, That's like the one my parents before you passed away on. I said, You had other parents before us? She calmly went on to explain that I shouldn't worry. They were her parents a long time before my husband and I were, but the ship they were on broke apart, and they are still at the bottom of the ocean. She then said when her before parents passed away, she and her sister Brunella had to be separated because no one could take them both. She said her sister went to live in Australia, but she stayed in Ireland. We live in the U.S. Story 12. My family and I were driving through the Kent countryside, and my brother, about three at the time, announced, Mummy, that was the field I passed away in once. I bayonet went through my tummy. I was eight, and remember wondering what a bayonet was exactly at the same time my parents looked at each other, and asked him how he knew what bayonet was. He said he didn't know and then became almost embarrassed and shy because of our collective reactions. There was no way he would have known about war or weapons as this was the early 90s, and we didn't watch TV much at all. I'm a complete skeptic, but this creeps me out to this day. Story 13. My younger sister, when she was three, started talking to my mom about when I was a big girl and you were a little girl. She said she went to my parents' wedding. She described her old self physically, and my mom says that sounded like my mom's grandmother, Grace. My sister also talked about the greenhouse she used to live in at the end of a dirt road and the fact that her mother, my mom's great-grandmother, Matilda, passed away from a snake bite while they lived there. 
She described the snake as pretty, and with the full description, my mom thinks she was describing a copperhead. Now we lived in northern Nebraska, no copperheads, and Matilda passed away in southeast Oklahoma, copperhead region. My sister said she terminated the snake with a hoe. These discussions always took place at bedtime. One day, we were putting in the garden and my dad was sitting down and sharpening the hoe with a file, and my sister told him he was doing it wrong. He told her to show him how to do it. She put her hands on his and placed them in the correct position. And later he said that she was right. He was doing it wrong. For those of you interested in timelines, this would be in 1980. My mother's grandmother Grace passed away in 1968, and her great-grandmother Matilda passed away in 1902. Also, we don't know if snakebite was the cause of death for her great-grandmother Matilda. I was 15 at the time these little nightly discussions were going on, so I remember them fairly well. She probably told these things on and off for about six months, and by four, she would say, I'm tired of talking about it. I am not a great writer, so I hope this is not too confusing. Story 14. My little brother, when he was little, like three or four, said that he was in the jungle saving animals, and one day he had to decide if he would stay with the animals or come live with us. He chose us, but reminded my mom that he couldn't stay forever, just for a little while. He passed this last January at 26 years old. Edit. I appreciate the love. Everyone make sure to say what you need to to those who need to hear it. I don't believe it's my place to tell the whole story, and I don't believe this is the forum. So I'll leave this as is. I also want to advocate for professional mental health for those who have experienced the loss of a child, sibling, parent, etc. Don't figure it all out alone. Go get help. Story 15. When my brother was about three back in the 90s, our family was sitting down for dinner, and he randomly said, Dad, remember when I lived in Spain? We're from the UK. And my dad, humoring him, said, yeah? And he continued that he lived in Spain before with his other family. But he passed away when he was on a fishing trip with his dad. And the last thing he remembers is his dad's hand trying to reach him as he drowned. He also reeled off some Spanish names for his parents, which there was no way he would have known those kind of names. And he started to sort of meditate in his room from time to time. He eventually stopped talking about it as he got a little older and doesn't remember anything about it anymore. Crazy to hear so many other people have similar experiences. Story 16. Not so much past life. When my son was about four, we were driving to daycare. He randomly pipes and says, Mommy, I had this dream where you were pregnant. We named the baby Dawson, but then he fell off the bed and passed away. He wouldn't give any more information than that. I was super weirded out. That evening, I decided to get a couple pregnancy tests, and sure enough, I was pregnant. Went through the next day and never mentioned anything to anyone, but the following day, I woke up with cramps. Ended up going to the hospital and found out I'd miscarried. Still never said anything to anyone about it. A few days go by and we're driving to daycare and my son says, Remember that dream I had about the baby? That's silly because you're not pregnant. I was absolutely floored. It was so weird. Story 17. I only have two vivid memories of my preschool years. I remember thinking of specific people that weren't here at the time, but I've no idea who they are from my memories. I feel like there's so much more to the memory that's just out of reach. The first one I would have been just learning to talk. So maybe 18. 24 months? I was standing in our gravel driveway on a hot day with my mom. I asked her for some wawa. She told me to say water. I asked for wawa again, but she told me, if you want a drink, you must say water. I distinctly remember the entire exchange and thinking, you know what I want? Why are you doing this? They said this one was going to be easy. The next time would have been a year or two later. My older sister excitedly told me, now you get to learn to read. And again, I distinctly remember thinking, no, they promised this time would be easy. This isn't easy. What is all this? I remember the feeling of disappointment from each of these moments. I love learning now, but I'm certain when I pass away, I'll be having a chat with someone about the meaning of easy. Lowell Bell, story 18. I was at a nature show with my daughter, the kind where they bring animals out and tell the audience about them. This particular show was about wolves, and the handler was telling the audience why she did what she did with the wolves. My daughter, maybe four at the time, said, I used to do that. I asked her what she meant. She said, just as factually as a four-year-old could possibly be, that she used to train dogs and wolves before she passed away. She herself looked confused for a bit, as though this thought was surprising to her as well. I didn't know what to say, so I said, well, that's interesting. She enjoyed the rest of the show and never spoke of it again. Edit. Thank you for the award, Internet Stranger. I'll be sure to pay it forward when I'm able. Story 19. I used to watch my nephew when he was about three or four. One day he was at my house and pointed to a magnet of Arizona. It had a picture of the desert with rock formations. Kid pointed at it and asked where it was. He said he used to live by red rocks like that with his first family who all had straight dark hair. His is blonde and curly. 
now, and that he had a mom and a dad, and he had had a brother until he went too far into the desert, too close to dark, and got eaten by not dogs, not wolves, but smaller. I said coyotes, and he kind of mouthed the word and said, Oh, that's what you call them. Then he was sad and didn't want to talk about it anymore, so we had lunch, and that was the first and last time he mentioned it. Story 20. I'm the kid in this case. I don't believe in the paranormal. I'm a pretty reasonable guy. I have degrees in science and healthcare, and I'm pretty grounded. But since I was a child, I had a memory of me stumbling out the back door of a club. I couldn't hold myself, either really drunk or on sweets. And I slipped down a staircase, hit my head in the alley, and passed away. I was about 19, I was thin, had long blonde hair, I was wearing a brown red leather jacket. I remember the neon signs, the staircase, the door I walked out of, even the interior. I can paint the picture perfectly if I had any talent in art. Anyways, so two years ago I took a leisure trip to Budapest, and while exploring the ruin pubs with my wife, I found the flipping alley. It was funny because I remarked to my wife earlier, when we arrived, that I felt something about Budapest that felt like home, and familiar, and I felt oddly too comfortable there, like I could have never left. I think about this quite often. Edit. Because I suck at Reddit, this is late. The alley is found in what is now Instant Club. I grabbed a clear photo of the area and my trajectory. Story 21. When I was four, there was something about the Royal Air Force on TV that showed Lancaster bombers doing a raid somewhere. It was just a news report, commemorating a raid or something, I think. Anyway, apparently, when I looked up at the TV from playing with my toys, I said in the clearest words something along the lines of, I really miss Ron from Scampton. Not sure if that's exactly how I said it. My parents asked me what I meant, and I said something like, he passed away in Germany. Needless to say, my parents ignored it and put it down to me just messing around. There was a few things about this that were very disturbing. One, I was four years old and living in Aberdeen, Scotland at the time. There was no way I could have known about Scampton, Lincolnshire. Furthermore, the RAF base that was there that happened to have Lancaster bombers based there during the Second World War. Two, who was Ron? As I said, my family didn't know anyone named Ron, and there was nobody in my class at school named Ron either. So where could I have possibly got that name from, and then roped it into a completely random sentence? 3. At four years old, I had very little concept of the Second World War. At that point, I probably knew it was between Germany and Allied countries, but nothing more than that. 4. This is the very scary part that gave me chills as soon as it happened. When I was 10, I moved to Nottingham due to my parents divorcing, which also happened to be about a 40 minutes drive from RAF Scampton. While in Nottingham, I joined the Air Cadets, which is quite similar to the American JROTC. Essentially, a starter recruitment process into the armed forces to show you what life is really like, while also being a sort of scout group. While in the Air Cadets, we would do visits to interesting places, mainly to do with the RAF, and one of the visits happened to be to RAF Scampton to have a look at the history of the base and the role that it plays today. Part of the visit was to go to the cemetery where the war graves are to pay our respects, and to my absolute surprise, I was shocked to see that there was a grave of a man named Ron Evans who passed away in a Lancaster raid over Germany in 1945. Like I said, it sent absolute chills down my spine, and my hair stood on end when I saw this, like it had just struck a nerve I didn't even know I had. It may be a coincidence or maybe not, I don't know, but I just thought it would be an interesting story to share. Story 22. Not a parent. But when I was young, I used to have a recurring dream where I was a Roman archer trying to fend off an attack from what looked like the Mongols. I would describe the armor and weapons to my parents without having seen them myself yet. At the time, I didn't know it was Roman armor or Mongolian clothing weapons. Once I did finally see the armor for myself, I was like, oh yeah, that's the armor in my dreams. I remember vividly that I was in a small line of archers next to a fort that had a tree right next to it, and the invaders came out of a seemingly dense forest on horseback. There was also a very slight hill going down from the tree to my left. The attackers were wearing some furs and had curved swords. They easily passed through the foot soldiers, and most of our arrows missed. I remember getting struck by the sword from the man in the front, on the left side of my head. Coincidentally, there is a single gray hair that grows in the exact spot I remember getting struck. Whenever my hair would grow out a little, that gray one would show up. I've tried searching for this fort through various Google image searches, but have only found a couple that seem similar. I don't have the dream anymore, but I can still remember what everything looked like. Story 23. My five-year-old daughter said to me, I was in your belly twice, Mama. The first time I passed away before I came out, but I came back. I did lose my first pregnancy eight months before getting pregnant again. She was never told. I don't know what it was, but that's what happened. Edit. Thanks, everyone. In typical Reddit fashion, I didn't expect this one to blow up quite so much. Lol. But my daughter is pretty awesome and has a crazy, amazing memory.
She recalls events from when she was two, so she very likely heard my husband and I discussing it. Any other explanation sort of, well, creeps me out. Ha! And pregnancy after miscarriage is a weird bundle of emotions. I understand how this can help people when they are feeling a loss, but that was not my intention with the post or anything. If it helps, I'm very happy to have shared this weird little memory. Be well, everyone. Story 24. We used to joke that our firstborn looked just like my grandmother, who passed away almost exactly a year before she was born. But then again, all babies look like my grandmother with the no teeth and big puffy cheeks and also we didn't think much of it. But one night when she was less than a year old, don't remember more specifically than that, she was really upset and would not calm down no matter what I did. At one point, I said out loud, Wow, you really do look like Grandma Hayden. She immediately stopped crying and slowly turned her head to look at me with this look of recognition on her face. Biggest chills I ever got in my life right there. Story 25. My son was two, but nearly three and just yammering away talking just any old words constantly. It was like he was practicing making sounds 24 sevenths. One day we are in the car and he is weirdly quiet. Not asleep, just sort of daydreamy. I say, what's up, T? And he says, I'm just sad. I miss my birds. What birds? Tutu and Tinga. I don't know who those birds are, T. It wasn't now, Mommy. It was before. When I had another Mommy. And you had birds? Like as pets? No, they lived in a tree next to our house at the edge of the jungle. So they visited me? They were friends, not pets. And he sounded so not too. He sounded like he was grown. And then he fell asleep in his car seat and wouldn't talk about the jungle and the birds when he woke up. Story 26. Not sure if it counts as a past life memory. It's more like channeling someone. My son was playing some kind of game at the kitchen table with my mother when he was three or four years old. He's usually very animated, but suddenly became really quiet and looked at his grandmother for a minute or so. She seemed shocked in what she saw looking back at him. Then he said, you're doing okay, and gave her a smile. Then he went back to his goofy self as she started to cry and left the table to hide in her bedroom. She later said that when he looked at her like that, his face and smile looked just like her dad's, and his voice sounded like her dad's voice for those few words. Her dad had passed away a few years earlier, and he had always told her how he was concerned about her future. She's never seen the resemblance like that in him again. Story 27. My daughter asked me, Remember my fancy hat? And when I said no, she said, Yeah, before I was dead, I used to work in a bank. I saved my money and bought a hat and a round box. I was on the bus and a man almost sat on it. Then the bus crashed and I passed away. She was about three and totally casual about it. Editing for clarity. My daughter definitely knew about hat boxes. She was very into musicals, one of which was Easter Parade, a movie where fancy hats were a very big deal. She went through a phase of being really interested in death after my mom passed away. So I think that's where the bus crash came from. At the time, we were talking a lot about death and dying and the idea that accidents can terminate a person and how scary that is. I personally think kids say weird stuff because they aren't yet fully wired. Intellectually, I reportedly used to talk to a teddy bear that lived in a cabinet at about the same age and would sit there happily chatting at an open door for ages. Story 28. I'm the child. Let me explain that I consider myself rational and am, for all intents and purposes, more towards science and logic than faith or the supernatural. That said, I have no explanation for this following other than it is what I experienced. I'll do my best to summarize it. I'm four or under. I have a brother that's four years younger than me and he wasn't born yet. And I'm spending the night at my grandparents' house. They are staying up late to watch the Olympics. But the plus side to that is that I get to sleep in their bed. Normally, I would sleep in my dad's old bedroom. I am having trouble falling asleep. A common occurrence, I never slept well. But seeing the light of the TV from the other room is calming. Suddenly, I feel cold. I don't feel scared, but my body gets the shivers. A new light is in the room, and it is to my right. Scared, I slowly begin to turn, and at the side of the bed is an older woman. She is translucent and has a slight blue tint. She is not scary, but her presence is. She is sitting in the rocking chair, holding a small dog and looking right at me. I immediately go under the blankets. I'm scared, and I turn to the other side of the bed. My eyes are slammed shut. I stay like this for what feels like an eternity until, still under the blankets, I open my eyes. A new color is outside of the blankets. A warm orange replaces the light blue. Like a fool, I begin the peek out of the blankets, and at the other side of the bed, there are men on fire. They are just standing there, but they are burning. I turn around in bed, and the woman is there, but now she is standing. Her mouth doesn't move, but in my head, I hear a voice say, They aren't there. They can't hurt anymore. And at that point, I don't remember anything else. The next morning, I didn't get out of bed until my parents arrived. It took a lot of coaxing, but eventually, I am able to tell my parents my nightmare. 
They are amused by a child's imagination. As a lark, my dad tells his parents. My grandfather, a cold and stoic man, almost passes out. When he comes to, he's crying and nonverbal. When he eventually calms down, he tells my father that when he got back from Vietnam, he would lie in bed and suffer from panic attacks. His mother would stand over him and calm him as he relived his days as a soldier manning a flamethrower. While he slept, she would sit in the rocking chair and make sure he rested. To this day, I have no explanation for it. I don't know why I saw his memory. I have no real supernatural experience other than this, but it is burned into my brain forever. Story 29. Not my kid, but a very close friend's daughter. When she was born, my friend and his wife lived in a Civil War era house. Very old, but super beautiful. Weird things happened. For instance, a peacock used to hang around the house until they brought their daughter home from the hospital. Never saw the peacock again. I was at the house once when the wife was in the basement to get some canned food. She came running up the steps screaming bloody murder. Said when she turned around from the canned food, there was a figure in a big brim hat staring from the far corner. And the daughter's room was always cold. But not just cold, a weird cold. The kind of cold that unsettles your stomach. And as she grew older, she was often seen on the video baby monitor sitting in the corner of her crib and talking gibberish to something off camera. Anyways, the family moved for work job reasons. Eight full years after they moved, the daughter was acting sad at the dinner table. When asked why, she said, I miss my friend from my old bedroom. My friend and his wife both were 100% spooked. Story 30. My mom swears that when I was a kid, I told her, Grandpa says he was really sorry. He didn't mean to hurt the family when I was like eight. I have no memory of this at all. I never had the chance to meet her father. He passed away before I was born. My mom cried when she told me about it. Edit. I, uh, didn't expect so many people wanted to know about old family history. So apparently my grandfather, my mother's father, was a bad drunk. He lost a lot of motor function in his early 30s, from what I can tell. My mom's memory is spotty and I couldn't get a hold of either of her brothers. From an accident, he spiraled down pretty hard after that. Made life a living hell for my mother and her three siblings and his wife. All kinds of cow wrecked my mom's first car, thrown out a beloved pet, general assholeness that bordered on abuse, and sometimes not so bordered. Near the end, he tried to make amends, though. Sold off his hotel in Corpus Christi TX, left the money in a state to the kids, tried to reach out to varying degrees of success and talk about it. This is all secondhand, mind you. My mom's feelings on the matter seem pretty complicated, and I've never seen any of this side of the family even mention the old man. Story 31. I'm late to this post, but I fully believe that my son is my grandfather V2. Here are a couple examples, but there's so many more I could share. When my son was about three, I took him to my grandma's house a few states away for the first time. Upon entering a house he'd never been in, he immediately toddled over to her, placed his chubby baby hand on her cheek, and said, I have missed you so much, Annie. Then he crawled in her lap, patted her hand, and said, I really liked your black hair. Several years prior, my grandmother Anne stopped coloring her hair let it go white, and started wearing a wig. No one but Grandpa called her Annie, ever. A while later, he was walking down the hall and saw a picture of my grandpa in the military band. He stopped at the photo and said, that was when I was playing in the band, while pointing directly at my grandpa. At the age of three, my son had never really told about grandpa other than he wasn't here anymore. I also had no pictures of my grandfather as a young man anywhere in our home. Story 32. I had something weird happen when I was 22. But then I remembered it about 20 years later. I was in the Navy in Hospital Corman School, which is like medical or nursing assistant. When I went through it in 1993, one whole week was devoted to pharmacy and meds. I knew all of the meds just by reading them in the textbook. It was like reading a book you've already read 10 or 20 times. I just knew all of the meds already. Somehow the name of those meds was already there in my brain. My classmates hated me for it. I couldn't understand it. But whatever. I got an A, now flash forward 20 years. One night I had a dream that I was back in hospital corpsman school and I was having to learn all of the meds. Except this time I was talking to one of my classmates and I was saying that I didn't need to learn the med names because it had already been drilled into my head from being a nurse for so long. Of course it's going to stick. I remember the dream because I woke up as I was saying the bit about being a nurse and my husband heard me. So maybe I was a nurse in a prior life. Story 33. I was the kid. When I was three, four... I had vivid recurring dreams of living in a white farmhouse with green shutters, a short drive with an old-fashioned red truck, and a horse barn attached at the back with a single black horse. I had this dream so often that I had almost convinced myself I had actually lived there and repeatedly asked my parents about it, even though my family had always lived in the same, very different house my entire life. This dream always ended the same way. 
with a balding man sneaking in the house and pushing me out an upstairs window, at which point I would always wake up. Eventually, I grew out of having the dream and had not thought about it for many years. Then, in my late teens, my boyfriend and I went on a road trip to a neighboring state. On a pretty empty, heavily forested back road, I saw the exact house for my dream. I demanded that my boyfriend turn around and he obliged. The house was indeed the exact same. And when I looked around the back, there was the same horse barn and parked next to it. An old red Ford truck. Story 34. Not the parent, but one of the children in question. My siblings and I all did something like this when we were little. Nothing too dramatic, though. My sister used to talk about all of her children from back when she was bigger. My brother talked about, and was obsessed with, being a lineman and climbing telephone poles. He used to love telephone poles and insulators from telephone poles. His favorite were the clear, aqua-colored glass ones that he would collect. He said he worked with them when he used to be bigger and wore overalls. Around the time I was two or three, I talked about fire people. There were a lot of fire people, apparently, and I needed to learn to make the fire so it doesn't burn the people. Story 35. I spooked my parents when I was about three. Okay, this is a little complicated. I'm adopted. When my soon-to-be adoptive parents were working with a social worker, my mom said that they'd be happy with any child, but that she had always wanted a red-haired girl. So the social worker was pretty excited to tell her that there were two red-haired baby girls up for adoption just then. My parents came to see me at the foster home, and that was that they never met the other red-haired baby. Fast forward a few years. I'm in a preschool class with another red-haired girl. My parents start talking to her as a find out that she was also adopted. She's the other baby the social worker mentioned. Weird but cool, right? My parents were always open about my adoption as much as you can explain to a three-year-old. Anyway, but the other girl's parents hadn't told her. So my parents didn't say anything until the end of the year, when the other girl's family was moving away. When my dad told me, hey, guess what, X was adopted too, I just responded, yeah, I know. When questioned about how I could know that, I said, X and me knew each other in heaven. Apparently, I explained that before we were here, we were waiting with the other babies. I told him that we watched people and decided which family to go to. X and me decided to be adopted and to meet each other on Earth. It's probably just a kid's silliness, but it's kind of a nice idea, I think. Story 36. I have met a few kids in the three, five age range that just know who I am. The one that really sticks out is the little girl that was shopping with her mom and asked her if she could go see Bill next door. The mom walks in and asks if there is a Bill that works here, looking obviously dubious, and I step up and introduce myself. The little girl wanted to say hi, and that was that, Lowell. She wouldn't answer any questions as to how she knew me or anything. I had a co-worker that was convinced I was the Antichrist after that, spouting something about how all the kids shall know his name, L-E-O-L. I have yet to get an answer from a kid as to how they know me, but it is interesting to me whenever it happens. I would be a lame pick for the Antichrist, though, so I think you all are safe for another generation, Lowell. Story 37. Very recently, I was actually talking to my parents about past life memories after I read this really interesting article. They ended up telling me about a past life memory I had aged five. They actually seemed a tad worried talking about it, but as they don't have read it, I will relay it, and just to be clear, I have no memory of this myself. So, aged five, my parents brought me one of them toy police cars. I spent a little while playing in it, but apparently didn't seem happy. My parents asked why I didn't seem to be liking it, and I apparently told them I didn't like it because I remember being stabbed inside a car like this before I came here. I said my skin was black then, though. They said they were a bit taken aback by this and just didn't speak anymore about it. But then a while later, my granddad came round and wanted me to show him my new toy. At this point, my parents tell me I refuse to get in it. Saying something like what I said to them, apart from this time, I said something more along the lines of I wasn't going to get in it, because when I drove it before I came here, I was stabbed and it hurt. I take it from how they speak about it that to them this seemed pretty weird. I understand that because it makes me feel weird as well. Out of curiosity, I thought I'd Google and try find if any police officers passed away from stab wounds around the time I was born. Now I was born in the, in art. I am sure that many police officers pass away in the line of duty each year, but one did stand out. The date when I was born had one registered police death. The officer was black and passed away after being stabbed to death in his own patrol car. Story 38. My three-year-old does it all, the time, and she has basically since she could talk. Like some others have mentioned, she also talks about her old mama and sometimes calls me her new mama. It's not manipulative, like, but my old mama let me do that. It's just passing comments like, my old mama didn't sing that song, she sang different ones. Or after we discuss a safety rule, she'll say, I know, my old mama used to say that too. She also talks about when she was a mother. She had four children, but one of them was mean and people didn't like him as much. How she lived in a town with lots of hills, 
And she didn't have a husband, and she baked lots and lots and lots of bread for people and always wore an apron. There are lots of stories of creepy things she'll say. But I get a kick out of how she likes to tell her dad and me that we passed away before. No details, but she insists that we passed away before we were us. Story 39. My three-year-old at age two explained that her mummy's mum was trying to tell me she loved me. That's my nan and grandma. She still refuses to call my mum her nan as she's her mummy's mum. Then she tells us how it was easier when she was a boy and that her big sister was always her mum and I am usually her baby and I was a good baby. Her brother has always been her brother and she's incredibly possessive about him. It's weird and hard to hear some things she says, but I thank her for telling us about it. She also says her other daddy was a bad person and hurt us all. He's apparently not the daddy she has now. The daddy she is not as good but not very old. It's odd, but it's repeated a lot, and she's incredibly factual. She's brought my poorly elderly mum so much joy. I'm sure she's the only reason my mum keeps going. They spend hours together, and neither can tell me what they've done or discussed, and yet the happiness in both their eyes is just amazing. Story 40. Not a parent, but the older sister. My older brother passed away when he was seven and I was two. It was tragic. He fell out of the bed of a truck just cruising around a neighborhood at normal speeds and cracked his head open on the concrete. This is the reason I am firmly against anyone riding in the back of trucks. Bad person accidents happen. Anyway, my little brother just turned seven. Recently, he has been saying things such as, I want to skip being seven inches and being seven makes me feel sick. It started out just like that. But now recently, he has been saying things like, Oh, just thinking about the accident. After we asked him what he's thinking about. I don't know how to feel about it. On one hand, kids say cow. He knows his brother passed away years ago. He knows he was seven and how he passed away. But on another hand, that one part of my brain is like, fudge man, that's crazy. He and my older brother look almost identical when you compare the photos. And according to my mother, they have a lot in common. Freaky cow, though. Edit. Some spelling mistakes. Story 41. This happened a while back, but both me and my mom experienced this together. My youngest sister, who was about two, three at the time, was in the bath laughing and playing. My mom asked who she was talking to, and she said, A boy named Jimmy! My papa, who had passed two years prior to her birth, was nicknamed Jimmy, and absolutely loved me and my other sister growing up. He was always playful and liked jokes or pranks, so I like to think he was just having a good old time with the granddaughter he didn't get to meet. On another note, we lived in the middle of nowhere and could identify family members' vehicles by what sound they made. He had a 1980s car that made a distinct rumble as it pulled up. Even after we sold it, we could still hear it coming down our driveway every once in a while. And then when you went outside, the sound would disappear.